So today is our last day of conference, and I feel a little bit sad that it's the last day, but that's normal. As my friend Tal told me, if you should this room. People are still outside, probably. Can somebody get people in? I think that people are still outside. Many people are still in. And pick a flower when you come in. Those are picked for you, even though I forgot to tell you. <laughs> I pick them every morning. The keynote speakers get a lay and you get a flower. <laughs> and we're all laid together, in a way. OK, so I wanted to greet a Chinese way that Roger aims. Our philosopher also worked uh, with Frank in the philosophy department. He suggested um, the idea of hello everyone separate us as an individual being. But uh, in China we say da jia hao. Da means big, jia means family, hao is good. That's how we greet each other in class in meetings. We say big family good rather than hello everyone. So that put us in one boat. Every time I speak, I always have that in me in, uh, as an assumption or as a background. So, um, so today I, I make that explicit. Thank you, for friend. I'm thinking of Chinese philosophy that keep me uh, on the toe of thinking more of a comparative terms. But it's the friend, it's friend that taught me is not just is not Chinese philosophy. That's incorrect. We have branches, just like Western philosophy. We have different branches, different schools of philosophy. So we can't just say Chinese philosophy, per se. And um, Frank and I have taken one whole class and two reading, two reading groups, two semesters with Frank. So I, I really appreciate that he took the time to come here to teach us and tell us stories about making sense of the Tao Te Ching the process of reading and interpretation. Tao Te Ching, as you may know, is one of the most studied or most popular texts in Taoism. So thank you for going through that with us and for us. And here I introduce Dr. Brett Perkins. Thank you. I, I did forget to uh, think about a theme. So we kind of play a theme each day. And regarding the last day, then we have beautiful flowers. They don't last forever. And our friendship lasts forever. And your being present here does not last forever. But your ideas, your thoughts, your innovation, your um, great work last in us. And we, we take on with it. So I thought the concept, I mean, uh, a theme for impermanence probably works for today. All right? So maybe go in this way. <laughs> and we have green for you today. Represent the Miss Hawaii color. I've been told I should use the microphone. So let's see how that works. Uh, so let me first thank Don Ping for inviting me and organizing this conference. Uh, and I'll be coming on a Saturday morning. I'm surprised there's so many people here uh, this early. So when Dan originally asked me to speak at this conference, I was nervous and reluctant and a bit evasive, in fact. And then when she said to do a keynote, I was really reluctant. <laughs> because my research doesn't explicitly connect to much of the focus of the conference. And I'll admit, I hadn't heard of 4D cognition until Dong Ping told me about the conference. But, but I know from, you know, I've been here a year and a half, and a sort of a year more of interaction with her, discussions with her, with students of hers, that we have a lot of similar interests, right, and a lot of overlapping interests. And I very much agree with her basic intuition that Chinese philosophy should be a resource for thinking through this kind of more process kind of view, I say broadly speaking. Right? And in fact, people usually think it's very odd that I specialized in early modern European philosophy and classical Chinese philosophy. And one explanation of that that I give people is that I'm interested in the idea of substance and its breakdown. And in early modern European philosophy, you see really the limits of that concept being pushed, almost a reductio of that concept in places. 
In Chinese philosophy, you get a philosophy that you never even thought in those terms in the first place. So it's not opposing substance, it's not promoting an alternative to substance, it's just not a kind of conceptual option for them. Which I think makes it different from Indian philosophy, which has very well articulated process philosophies, but they're still couched as opposed to something else. Right? Um, so my paper today is not directly on Chinese philosophy. If we think, though, about right, the idea of foreign cognition, right, that, that language, that cognition is always enacted, embodied, embedded, then we really need to be skeptical of the idea that I would just talk about classical Chinese philosophy. Because the meaning, of course, has to be in some way enacted now. right? And it's embedded not in ancient China. I mean, in some ways, it's hybrid between ancient China and the circumstances now. So that's what I really want to focus on, is this process of reading and interpreting the Lao Tzu. Uh, and in doing that, I hope that it will maybe give some material that would be interesting for you to reflect on a kind of case study that's looking more at reading and ancient texts rather than sort of live language. Most of my discussions with don't think about language are about learning language now, conversation now, right? So that might be interesting. And you might have some sort of conceptual resources for you as well. So this has been a broader kind of attempt to, to shift our orientation toward the Dao Te Ching, right? It's a broader project that I'm working on. All right, that said, I should introduce the Dao Te Ching first in case people are not familiar with it. So very briefly, uh, so Jing means classic, Dao is like the way, the path. Da is hard to translate, but maybe virtue, maybe power, maybe excellence, something like that. It's short, it's 81 chapters, often rhyming, essentially poems, about 5,000 characters. The traditional story is that it was written by a guy named Lao Gan, or Master Lao, Lao Tzu. Uh, he was a senior of Confucius, supposedly, and he taught Confucius some about rituals. And supposedly the text was not only written by one person, but was written at once. So Lao Tzu was heading west out of China, possibly to go to India and found Buddhism. And he was stopped at the gate, and they said, look, you need to leave us some remnants of your wisdom. And he wrote the Daijin. So 500 BC. That view is held still by people who believe in religious Taoism, and it's held more or less by, by many scholars in China now. Among Western scholars, and among Chinese scholars, many Chinese scholars for the past you know, century or so, it's been questioned to different degrees. And one reason for that is these amazing archaeological finds that they've had in China in recent years. So they found now four different ancient manuscripts of the Tao Te Ching. The most significant and the oldest is this Huodian bamboo slips. So that's from buried at 300 BC. Uh, the, that's what they were written like, right? So they were written from top to bottom, and then they would be strung together so you could roll them up and unroll them. <coughs> Unfortunately, the strings all decayed, so it's essentially a bunch of random strips that we place back together. Uh, but what's significant there is, first of all, that it's only 31 of the 81 chapters of the Lao Tzu. And even that, many of those are partial. The wording is different. It's quite different from what we have as the received text. The Malongdui ones are more similar to the received text. There were two manuscripts found there written on silk. Uh, but they still have many differences, right, and some important differences. And then more recently, there's this Beida bamboo strips manuscript uh, that was published a couple of years ago. Right? So that's another version. Uh, so what that means and this is something I'd, I'd have to argue a long time to convince people of, but this is just my hypothesis, right? I think undeniably, it means that even if there was an original Lao Tzu who wrote a text in 500 BC, what we have is very different from that, because 300 BC, it's very different from what we have now, right? So it's unlikely that our account is more accurate than that one, right? So even if the story is true, it's disrupted by these excavated texts. More plausibly, though, I think the Guodian Lao Tzu, that kind of 31 chapters was probably a complete unit to which other materials were laid at it, right? So that the whole Lao Tzu, the whole Tao Te Ching is really a composite of different positions from around that time, more or less integrated together. And if that's true, then there isn't really even a, a kind of authorial intention behind the text, right? A single authorial intention. So again, that's my hypothesis. My account doesn't really depend on that, but that's anyway, what I would want to argue. I want to focus more on proliferations of the Lao Tzu. So even in the text of, well, what is the Chinese, like the original text, there's proliferation. There's different transmitted versions. There's now four different excavated text versions, right? Beyond that, there's 
we have references to at least 700 Chinese commentaries on it. About half of them we still have, right? So that's all of those are different, right? Each one of those person felt like there needed to be a new commentary, right? Um, it's I think the most widely translated text aside from the Bible, right? So over 250 translations, all different perspectives. The earliest ones were Christian missionaries, right? Where Tao is more like God or Logos sometimes. You have, but you have sort of, sort of adamant atheists, you have lots of mystics, Nietzscheans, I'm thinking of Hans Georg Moller there, uh, pragmatists like Roger Ames, right? You have people who are famous for other things, so Aleister Crowley, the kind of occultist. Um, he didn't know Chinese, but a spirit came and explained the true meaning of the text to him. And his translation is based on that. Ursula Gwynn doesn't know Chinese, but she worked with a Chinese person to translate it, right? Uh, Timothy Leary. <coughs> I have an example from him. I put Heidegger in parentheses because he worked on a translation with a Chinese scholar but didn't complete it. I don't have it, right? so I put him there. Uh, I think some of these people knew Chinese, some of them don't. I think the person who's made the most money off of the Tao Te Ching is Stephen Mitchell, who is kind of a slightly new aging mystic writer, and he doesn't know Chinese. Right? So his translation of the Lao Tzu is basically his intuitions and piecing together other people. Now this, though, this process is by no means new, and certainly by no means Western. 139 BC, in the Huainanza Taoist text, right, Huainanza says, the Lao Tzu says, govern a great state like cooking a small fish. That's a quote from the Tao Te Ching. He says, those who are for leniency say, that means do not disturb it much. Those who are for strictness say, give it only salt and vinegar. This is already 139 BC. We could add to that, I think, probably the only time an American president has quoted ancient Chinese philosophy. I don't know if people are aware of it. Uh, right? Where it illustrates ideas like the individual's right to reach as far and as high as his or her talents were permit, the free market as an engine of economic progress, and as Al Tzu said, govern a great nation as you would cook a small fish. Do not overdo it. <laughs> the quotation mark is actually misplaced there, right? That's actually Ronald Reagan's commentary on the text, I guess, right? But very close to what the Wainan says. Certainly no more outside the range of plausibility than the ones that Wainan says suggests himself. Looking kind of further, I want to kind of do further progressions of this proliferation, right? So another similar political use, right? A leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. It's a pretty reasonable translation of that quote, right? Um, if you look closely, though, you can see that it's a uh, Ron Paul posters, right? Ron Paul, this is Ron, the back of Ron Paul's head. So it's essentially a meaning of that quote, which again is a reasonable translation, simply by putting it in the context of this photo, right? Of a Ron Paul campaign poster. Uh, another interesting political version. So this is a common. Lao Tzu quote, if you search online for Lao Tzu quotes, when a nation is filled with strife, then do patriots flourish. It's got a kind of, I guess, American revolutionary patriot with a flag, right? It's called US flag dot company, right? Uh, that's China. another poster of it. Made in China. <laughs> sure, yes. yes. Uh, and this is my translation of the passage that it's from. So when the great ways of man, there's benevolence and rightness. When wisdom is expressed, there's great deception. When the six relations are not harmonious, there's filial piety and parental care. When the states and districts are in chaos, there are loyal ministers. So patriots is actually kind of an interesting translation of loyal ministers. It's not, it has certainly very different connotations, but it's not a terrible translation of it. But it seems like this poster is saying the opposite of what the Lao Tzu is saying. So the Lao Tzu is saying patriots are bad because they only arise when things are, have gone bad, right? Um, the view that seems to be put here is more of a confusing view, right? It's when things are in trouble, then it's, that's when you need to act, right? Really, I think it's the opposite of what the Lao Tzu is telling us. But the interesting thing is, because many Confucians have read the Lao Tzu, they do interpret this passage along these lines, to say, you know, it's true that ideally you wouldn't need patriots, but in reality you do, and so Confucians become loyal ministers. Right? So it's not unheard of, right, even in the Chinese tradition, this kind of interpretation. Um, another particularly weird, interesting one, and if you're familiar with the show Criminal Minds, right, it's a uh, FBI psychological profiling team that tracks serial killers. Right? So it's been on probably 10 years now or something. It's been a long time. One trope of the show, though, is they start with a quotation every episode. So they've quoted Lao Tzu a couple of times. This one is, when I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. 
So I read that and I was like, that's just not Lao Tzu. That's just a fake Lao Tzu. <laughs> and then I thought, you know, I, a Chinese friend had turned, directed me to this PPTV for basically watching pirated American TV shows. So I thought, I'll check that. And it's subtitled. So some poor Chinese person saw this quotation and had to figure out what, how to translate it into Chinese. And they mapped it to a real Lao Tzu quote. So the real Lao Tzu quote, my translation is, because they never consider themselves great, thus they can complete their greatness. So it's a pretty loose translation that makes it sound much more individualistic, right? But what's interesting, like in that poster, is it seems to be a message of like self-control, self-determination. Whereas the original Lao Tzu message is more toward the opposite, right? But it's really about humility, is what the original passage is. It's by not considering yourself great, you can then become great. So other <coughs> common wisdom from Lao Tzu, it's a decent translation of the original line, right? This is uh, the fortune I got at Panda Express in that last year. I take it to be a translation of the Lao Tzu quotes. Um, lots of things that Lao Tzu didn't say, but he maybe would have said, he wouldn't necessarily disagree with, so care about what other people think and you will always be their prisoner. <laughs> the trope of being their prisoner was not something that would be used in a Taoist context, it's kind of more of a stoic kind of trope, right, of self-control, autonomy versus being controlled by others. But Lao Tzu doesn't think you should care much about what other people think, you know, so it's not too far into him. Um, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. I don't know who said that, but it wasn't Lao Tzu. <laughs> it would be an interesting search just to see all the different people that's been attributed to. I kind of thought it was a Bible quote, but it's not a Bible quote either. I don't know what it's from. And then there's this. Um, this is quoted, this is a Lao Tzu quote that's quite common. Um, Lao Tzu says nothing like that. There's nothing on music in the entire Lao Tzu for the first thing. There's not really an idea of the soul. I don't even understand what it's supposed to mean or why it's good. Like, who cares if the universe hears music in your soul? What does that even mean, right? So it's like a popular quote consistently attributed to Lao Tzu. And then to put it in this context of Yoda with headphones on, <laughs> maybe plugged into R2-D2 as the, the media player, given that Yoda itself is being kind of pulled out of Chinese, like the idea of force is so close to the idea of qi, right? It's, it's very hybrid cultural. I don't even know what to think about this quotation. Uh, so what are we to make of all this kind of proliferation of meanings, right? Well, it tends to make scholars freak out um, and be upset that there are all these mistranslations and misuses of the text. And I understand that, right? And I get annoyed with translations of by people who don't know Chinese and things like that, of course. Right? But still, what the lesson I need to take out of it is that the significance of the Laozi is not in some universal message, universal transcultural message. Right? That's not the significance of the text, in fact. Right? In fact, the significance of the text is as a transcultural site for the generation of new meanings or the proliferation of new meanings. Right? And a few observations about that. One is that this is exactly the same as the way it's used in the Chinese context. Right? So you have people taking quotations out of the context of the Laozi, using them as practical wisdom, using them for political purposes, including ones that, again, seem more far off than Reagan's use of it. Uh, the legalist uses of it often seem like that. You have lots of quotations that are attributed to Lao Tzu that Lao Tzu didn't say, and of course, on my view, Lao Tzu didn't say any of them. Like, it's all a false attribution, right? Um, and that means that, although, I, I mean, I'm part of, you know, I try to get the true meaning of the text, that is probably not, that concern for authentic meaning is not really an authentic use of the text. Right. So I mean, it's a legitimate use of the text, but it's not the way the text was traditionally used. And Quinans already sees that. Right. Furthermore, it's not even clear what we could mean as the true meaning of the text. If it really is compiled from different perspectives that are then edited together in different ways, woven in different ways, words added here, deleted there, what would it even mean to figure out the true meaning of that text? Right? And that's where it's a good illustration of, I mean, we could kind of, in a postmodern way, talk about the death of the author. But here it's just a reality. Like, there is no actual author to the text. Right? And that makes it, I think, a useful example. The last thing is that I don't want this to mean that the meaning then is just subjective. Right? And that's where I think you know, some of the conceptual resources that people are talking about here right, is precisely to get out of that dichotomy that either like, there's an objective meaning to the text, or the text just means anything that you want it to mean, 
right? Like it's clearly neither of those options. Um, and this leads into three questions. So one is, or more than three, right? But these three are what I'm going to think about. One is what makes the Lao itself so open to interpretation? What's the sort of source for these variations? That's the main question that I've worked on, right? And that's what that's the way I've been looking at the Lao Tzu. That's what I'll primarily focus on. The second one is, if it can mean so many different things, what keeps it valuable, right? Like why, why not just talk about anything? Like it's just a blank slate. Anything could hold that function. So why the Lao Tzu? The last thing would be like, how do these different meanings emerge? What are the various factors that determine it? And the last point is probably most relevant overall to the, the conference, but it's also the one that I haven't done the work. <laughs> um, I've been working sort of forward through the questions, I guess. And in fact, I hadn't really thought about the third question that much until I was thinking about it in relation to this, this conference. Oh. So I want to give a few examples. First of, this is just a list of what some of the things that make it so open to interpretation. There's, of course, the question of what base text you're going to use. And I've had this argument with some students where they just pick whichever one says the thing that they want the text to say. Right? And I'm like, you know, like, you've got to pick one, use that one, and if you want to use a different one, you've got to argue why you want to use that other one. Right? But you can just pick and choose and find the one that says the thing that fits what you want the most. Of the meaning of each character, if you no classical Chinese, then you know this. If you don't, it's you'd be surprised at how many meanings every given character has, right? I mean, probably on average you'd have ten entries in a dictionary, but of those three, maybe average three would be almost completely different meanings. Right? On top of that, they make mistakes in these, right? They often do homophones, I guess you'd say. So a character that's the wrong character but sounds like the right character. So if you really don't like what it says, you can always say, but that's not actually the word it should be. It should be this other word instead. Right? Um, grammatical ambiguity, so there's no punctuation in the original. In classical Chinese, almost any character can be acting as a noun, or a verb, or an adjective, or an adverb. So that creates all kinds of variations. There's things like interpreting the images. So it just says, govern a state like cooking a small fish. What does that mean? <laughs> that could mean lots of different things. right? So that gives you variations. How to make the text consistent when it seems to say things that are inconsistent is maybe the main source of creativity in interpreting the text. And that's particularly the case if, on my view, it was not originally consistent. Right? Then, then you have to make up something if you're making a consistent meaning for the text. And then there's the issue of translation, which obviously applies in English, but and no one thinks or speaks in classical Chinese. So anyone who reads the text deals with the problem of translation. It's maybe less of a problem from classical Chinese to modern Chinese, but it's still an issue of translation. So I want to give one, I think, somewhat technical but interesting example, and then I'll focus on two other passages. Um, my idea was to talk for about 40 minutes. We started a little bit late, but I'll, I'll see how it goes. Um, so chapter 39, this is just part of the chapter. It says, thus the noble must take the lowliest root, the high must take the lowest foundation. For this reason, dukes and kings call themselves the orphan, the lonely, and the starved. This is taking the lowliest root, isn't it? Thus the greatest enumeration or greatest number of chariots is without chariots. For this reason, do not desire to dazzle and shine like jade, but to be firm and steady like a rock. So that literal translation of the line is like, what does that mean? Right? Like, what? Sense does that mean? And so you have literally millennia of people trying to make up some explanation for what that means. Here are some examples just from English. So Hendricks translates it, therefore they regard their large number of carriages as having no carriage. So he sort of takes the first as objective and subjective. So they have they actually have a large number, but to their mind it's like having none. Um, Hansen translates it literally the extreme of numbering chariots is zero chariots, but again, like, what does that mean? It doesn't make any sense, right? or doesn't give any clue to what it means. When Sit Chan and the far go in similar direction, therefore enumerate all the parts of a chariot as you may, you still have no chariot. Yes, enumerate the carriage parts, still not a chariot. What's interesting there is that that would not occur to anyone who had not read the dialogue with King Melinda, which is an Indian text, right? Indian Buddhist text, that argues that chariot is just a convenient label for the parts of a chariot, in the same way that self is a convenient label for the various elements that, that compose us. Uh, so here, and that of course is already a weird cross-cultural encounter because King Belinda is a sort of leftover Hellenistic king, right, from India, and this is transmitted into China, uh, but certainly was not around, not in China at the time that the Lao Tzu was written, right? So that, that lens, that, that interpretation I think is very much 
is not likely, right, in that Chinese context. Or if it is, they predicted this Buddhist point far ahead of time. But this is what's interesting now, right? Is the earliest version we have is the Ma Wangdui A version. This is a little complicated to explain if you don't know any Chinese, but the, the short of it is that most Chinese characters have one element that connects to the pronunciation and one element that connects to the meaning. One thing that we've learned from these excavated texts is that they often just wrote the phonetic without the meaning part. So if you memorized the text, you knew the text, you knew which character they were talking about, but thousands of years later, we don't necessarily know which one they are. So the process of transmitting the text were people adding in the meaning part to clarify. Right? As time went on, people didn't know. So the original set has this you, which means with or to give. That would mean like the most giving is no giving or something like that. Uh, it would be kind of odd to say. But it seems like that, that's a very common phonetic. And it was probably just a phonetic. Right? And someone thought you needed to add a chariot to that phonetic, and you get the word carriage. Now it looks like someone else thought you had the word speaking to it, and you get praise or fame. Right? Now that we know the original just was the phonetic, this person's solution, the last one, is clearly the most plausible. Right? It, it makes perfect sense this way. The greatest fame is to have a fame. It's still a paradox, but it fits all the lines before it because it's all about not being famous, keeping a low profile, all these kinds of things. Right? But what happened was, after this interpretation was put in, which was quite early, someone then substituted a different word that also meant card or carriage. So when you get to this point, you have no way to bridge to this character. Right? Like you've lost any chance to get to what this originally meant, because you've lost the phonetic. Right? So you could say, I mean, one might want to say, well, like, now we have the true meaning of this line. There's some reason to say that, yeah, now we have the true meaning. But at the same time, the vast majority of people who read this text didn't take it to mean this. They took it to be about chariots. Like, that was the actual text they were reading, right? Um, and the broader point is that we happen to get lucky and find an excavated text that explained this to us. But surely there are many other things like that going on where we haven't found the thing that tells us where the mistake is, right? And I guess my point is that this is really during the millennia of difficult creative work to make sense of essentially an error. <laughs> okay, so and I want to focus on chapter five. This is the whole passage. Heaven and earth are not humane. They take the myriad things as straw dogs. Say to the people are not humane, they take the people as straw dogs. The space between heaven and earth is in it like a bellows, empty but never used up. The more it moves, the more it comes out. Hearing much leads quickly to exhaustion. It is not as good as protecting the center. So a variant of the text has speaking much instead of hearing much in that last line. So the key, first key question here is when it says not humane, what does that mean? Right? It's a negative claim. So what is it saying it's not? The character for humane there is Ren. And it has different meanings in different contexts. So for Confucius, it's sort of the highest virtue is often translated just as goodness. Right? In the Muodza, it's also pretty much the highest virtue but they have a more specific definition where it is caring for everyone equally. Right? Specifically, they say caring for other people as, as in the same way that you would care for your parents, with the same kind of effort that you would use in caring for your parents. For Mengzi, it has a more specific meaning as one of four virtues that's focused on um, compassion. Right? So, so um, felt concern for other people. And it has a particular association. So one is natural human feelings of care. So there's a naturalness to the basis of Ren. That's also tied into this connection to family. We naturally care for family. And it's often taken as, as defining the essence of being human. And that's partly rooted in the character itself, which shows a human being next to the number two. Right? So when it says it's not that, it could be playing on any of these different senses. Right? Um, and so here's just some well-known examples of how to sort out this first line. So Suja, Song Dynasty philosopher, says, having no self-interest, heaven and earth encourage the 10,000 things to their own self-becoming. Thus the 10,000 come into being and pass away on their own. Due to no cruelty of mind, they die of themselves. Due to no kindness of mind, they come into being of themselves. So this is, I think, maybe the most plausible interpretation. It's not that heaven and earth are, have vice. It's not that they're vicious, right? But they don't have virtue either. They're indifferent. Good things happen, bad things happen without any concern on the part of the nature. Right? It fits our idea of the Taoist view. Hans-Jürgen Moller has a similar view, but he's spinning it toward his own sort of 
Nietzschean and I would say anti-humanist concerns, right? So he says this is one of the most outspoken non-humanist chapters in the Lao Tzu. Just as heaven and earth are major, not treat the ten thousand things, but it's all kinds of beings in the world with compassion. So the sage does not have particularly humane feelings for others. So this does not mean the sage despises humanities. He's totally unbiased and impartial and void of one-sided emotions. Mm -hmm. right, so it's a pretty similar reading. John Gray, who is not a scholar of Chinese philosophy, right, um, but he's an anti-humanist, um, gives it a, again, pushes it a little bit further. Right? He says, humanism is a secular religion thrown together from decaying scraps of Christian myth. In contrast, the Gaia hypothesis, the theory that the Earth is a self-regulating system whose behavior resembles in some ways that of organism, embodies the most rigorous scientific naturalism. But the idea of Gaia is anticipated most clearly in a line from the Tao Te Ching, the oldest Tao of scripture, heaven and earth are ruthless, and they treat the myriad creatures as straw dogs. If human beings disturb the balance of the earth, they will be trampled on and tossed aside. Um, the metaphor of straw dogs, one interpretation is that they were used in rituals to represent animal sacrifice, but without actually having to kill the animals. Right? So you'd use it, and then they would be burnt or thrown away or destroyed. Right? So, uh, yeah, but that's another, pushing it a little bit in the direction. This Lawrence Gonzalez's book, Deep Survival, is more like a popular book, although it's quite wise, I think, in many ways. Um, it's basically stories of people who survived in very difficult conditions, right? So this is, he's actually talking about Hawaii here, and I found this before I knew I was going to move here. He says, a few days later, I was snorkeling, I kayaked with the same guy to a secluded beach, and she told me the same thing. The current, just a short distance out, would carry me beyond her sandy beach. Then the cliffs would prevent me from getting back to land. The next put in was six miles, so it'd be all right if you can tread water for six miles, she said. And I started to think, whoa, paradise is some serious business. Whereas the Tao Jane puts it, heaven and earth are inhumane. They view the myriad creatures as straw dogs. Right? So this is more just a kind of caution about the dangers of nature. Another direction, Henry Balfour, this is maybe the earliest translation of the Lao Tzu. He translates it, if heaven and earth were not benevolent, they would regard creation in the light of grass, which is worthless, and dogs, which are killed. If the sage were not benevolent, he would likewise regard the people in the light of grass and dogs. And Balfour adds a note, the commentator, this is the Chinese person he's talking with, insists at some length that the phrase not humane is hypothetical and must not be taken as stating an actual fact. So he reads it essentially as saying the exact opposite of what it seems to say. But it, grammatically, it's readable that way. Right? Grammatically, with classical Chinese, you can leave out the hypothetical, especially in a, a dense text like the Tao Te Ching. And it is a Chinese way of reading it. Right? So it's a Christian, I mean, it's a Confucian way of reading it, becoming a Christian way of reading it, right? when it's being translated across these lines. Because he doesn't want to say heaven and earth are not moral. right? So he finds a way to say that they are moral. A more bizarre one, I think, that's much earlier, is the Shamar commentary, one of the earliest commentaries we have. And this is more religious Taoist perspective. It says, heaven and earth imitate Tao, being humane to those who are good and not humane to those who are evil. Thus, when they destroy the myriad things, it's the evil they do not care for, seeing them like straw, and grass, or dogs, and livestock. Sage people model themselves after heaven and earth, being humane to good people and not humane to evil people. When kings govern and destroy evil, they also see them like straw and dogs. Those people should accumulate good deeds and let them the refined essence and spirit will commune with heaven. If someone wants to bully and harm them, then heaven will save them. So his this view is heaven and earth are not humane to bad people, but they are humane to good people. Right? Again, it seems to be just the exact opposite of what we would take the message of that passage to be. But again, this is a very authentic Chinese interpretation. And if we think about this as fundamental to Taoist religion, we might even say this is the most common interpretation. Right, so philosophers would all think this is a ridiculous reading, but it's a common reading of it. But, uh, so proliferation in terms of popular culture of the phrase straw dogs. Um, this was a Boston punk band that I saw in high school for the first time I encountered the phrase like the bottom one. I pulled out the phrase from my own book. The title of my own book comes off of the first lines of this where I'm applying to the problem of evil. Uh, I'm going to skip around a little bit because I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, just a little bit on the last line. So I've been focusing on the, the split around the first lines, right? But the last lines, I'll give you two examples of that. So one is, this is Timothy Leary's Psychedelic Prayers After the Tao Te Ching, his translation of chapter 5. Breathing, notice how the space out there between heaven and earth is like a bell. It's breathing, always full, always empty, always full, always empty. Breathing, come in here, go up there, come in here, go up there. Breathing, silence, breathing. This is no time for talk. Better to hold fast to the void breathing. 
So he does at least say it's after the Tao Te Ching. It's not a translation of the Tao Te Ching. Um, he just ignores the first part about heaven and earth not being benevolent. Right? Um, the ironic thing is that, well, I'll come back to the ironic <laughs> the justification for that. Um, but to give another example of a kind of, let's say, misuse of those parts, that's another story from the Huayanza. Uh, right, so this guy's traveling with a bunch of books. He meets this kind of sage who then criticizes books because he thinks things are always changing. Books have fixed wisdom, right? And so those who understand speech do not hoard books. Upon hearing this royal longevity, he made a bonfire of his books and danced about with joy. Therefore, the loud says an excess of words leads to countless impoverishments that cannot compare to preserving the center. So, do those lines really mean you should burn all of your books? <laughs> I don't think that occurred to anyone. You know, if, if this is as early as people say, there weren't even books around, probably, when it was said, right? Uh, I think when it was said, probably there were books, but I don't think it has anything to do with burning your books, right? This is a kind of another interpretation of it, another use of it. Uh, so the last question of that, that proliferates meaning of this is how do the three parts fit together? And you know, with more time, it would be fun to actually just think, like, okay, what can you find to fit these things together? And you know, the center might connect to the space in the bellows, right? The, the thing with the bellows, it's never used up, so that connects to the exhaustion. It's more of a stretch to connect it with the first four lines, but of course, Anybody who writes a commentary finds some way to fit these all together. Now it seems that they didn't go together. That's why you can't figure out how they fit together. The Guadian text only has the lines on the bellows. So where the other lines came from, we don't know. I mean, they could be just as old. They could be older. But they weren't put together until some later point. Right? And that's what's saying. The irony with Timothy Neary leaving out the first four lines is that, in fact, they're not an integral part of the passage. Right? And the fact that they don't fit together is part of what clues, like, that's part of why he leaves it out, right? Is he, they don't fit together. Right, let me see what I want to. Um, I'll say a little bit to, I would say a little bit to justify this Shamar commentary. Um, right, so the last line says, if someone wants to bully and harm them, then heaven will save them. And that, as I said, seems very implausible as a reading of that passage. But if you consider chapter 67, you can see why it says that. So this lays out three virtues, right? Nurturing care, frugality, not daring to be first. It says if you have those virtues, you will succeed in the world. And it particularly ends by emphasizing nurturing care. Now with nurturing care, if they go to battle, they are victorious. If they undertake protective measures, they are secure. Heaven will establish them as if using nurturing care to fortify them. So, Ellen Chen gives, I think, a, a very reasonable reading of that in terms of religious Taoism. She calls it the salvific power of the Tao. But for most philosophers, there are two problems with this passage. Right? One is that it doesn't seem to fit with saying heaven and earth are not humane. It seems to be saying heaven and earth, it will take care of you if, you're, if you have compassion. Right? The other is that most philosophers who read the Tao Te Ching read it because they don't like the idea that there would be some divine figure who's going to take care of us. Right? That's precisely why they like the Tao Te Ching, is because they don't like that idea. So then you have a problem. Well, how do you get around what this seems to say? And there are various possibilities. So Roger Ames right, um, talks about the natural power of family feeling. Right? Real courage is dependent on the fellow feeling of the army being dispatched in the battle, and you can't succeed in war without it. In nature's own story, so he's moving from heaven, which is a much more religious concept, to nature's own story. Each thing emerges within a cocoon of familial feelings as the first line of defense that buffers it against a sometimes hostile world. Um, well, Lord Chandalis uses this passage also, where he basically says people who survive, one reason they survive is because they care about other people more than about their own survival. Right? And this again is not just a Western thing. So Han Feiza, the earliest commentary on this, um, compares this nurturing care toward a mother's care for a child and how that leads to a bravery and the ability to do things. Uh, and then the last one I'll mention is Stephen Mitchell, the guy who said he doesn't know Chinese. Uh, he changes the meaning almost completely, but in a subtle way. Right? So he says, I have three things to teach, simplicity, patience, compassion, simple actions and thoughts to return to the source of being, patient with both friends and enemies to accord with the way things are, compassion toward yourself, you reconcile all beings in the world. Now the passage is clearly about actually succeeding in the world if you have these virtues. Whereas Mitchell's interpretation is subjective, 
right? It's not that you will succeed, but that you will accept whatever happens, right? You will reconcile yourself to whatever happens. And honestly, that's how I read the text when I first read it in high school and for a long time, is that it's about accepting whatever happens. And when it says, if you do these things, you will not be killed, well, that doesn't mean you won't be killed. It just means you won't care if you're killed. Like, you'll be okay with being killed. And part of the reason why I read it that way is because I read Stephen Mitchell's translation very early on. Right? And this is a way, another way of getting out of this word providential, godlike kind of language there. Okay. So this then is the, the last thing I'll say. Uh, moving from the, the interpretability to what makes it spread. And I think it divides into kind of two different aspects. So on the one hand, people like it because, precisely because you have the space to make it your own. And one thing that does, and it's you're making it your own, but you're also like borrowing the authority of a sage at the same time, right? Um, and Raymond Smullyan, who is again not a China scholar, but has a quite an interesting book on the Tao, says, when I first came across the Taoist writings, I was instantly delighted. I did not feel that I was reading something strange or exotic, but that I was reading the very thoughts I've had all my life, only expressed far better than I've ever been able to express them, right? Now, of course, he only reacted that way because he, he put his own ideas into the reading of the text, right? It's like a mirror for him, right? You see how open it is to different interpretations, and this is why he thinks it's just saying what he's always thought, is because that's, that's what he's putting into the text, right? The marketing side, this is one of the ones that does annoy me, right? Chapter five, the couple's Tao Te Ching, love dances throughout the cosmos, finding together all there is, every living thing is welcome, without a word of criticism, welcome each other with the same expansiveness, right? No connection at all to chapter five. Nothing on the bellows, no heaven and earth are not humane, nothing about talking too much. Completely made up. So you say, why? Well, because he has a whole series of made up books called The Students' Tao Te Ching, The Couple's Tao Te Ching. And what are you going to buy? Like William Martin's kind of cheesy poems on love or the Tao Te Ching, right? You're going to buy the Tao Te Ching. And so it's a marketing tool, right? It has no connection to the original text at all. And this, again, is not new, right? Huainanza says, a music master from Honda made up a new tune and said it was composed by Li Qi. All the people died to learn it. Later, when they discovered it was not written by him, they all gave up the tune. Now, if we should get a new text from a sage and attribute it to Confucius or Moza, then those disciples who point to every sentence and accept it will certainly be numerous. Right, again, 139 BC, Huainanza points this <laughs> oh. The other side, though, is that, and I think this is part of what makes it a meaningful text is it has these wise sayings that are sometimes obvious and trite, sometimes counterintuitive, but they're put into this like really profound seeming context with this kind of unity of all things and paradoxes that make it seem like there's something much deeper when you say, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Like there's something really profound behind that, right? Uh, that I think is part of what then keeps this interpretiveness going. Uh, so that's the end. The last thing I would say is that. Again, I, I, and I didn't focus on how this doesn't mean the meaning is just subjective. It's not that we're just making up the meaning, right? Because it's, it's part of the meaning is being controlled by the text itself, but the other part is largely being controlled by societal pressures. Like the marketing aspect is going to vary by different things. You see clearly in these the people who are who don't want there to be something like a god, that's how they read the text. The one who want there to be something like a god, that's how they read the text, right? The ones who are humanists read it that way, the anti-humanists read it that way, right? Those are not choices that individuals make necessarily. There's societal factors going on in the background. Okay, I'll stop there. Sorry, I went a little bit longer than I was.
mistranslations, uh, quoting, uh, taking lines out of context and putting them in a context that actually he projects on the texts and so on, so forth, all of these things. Um, I also find, of course, that it's, it doesn't stop at that, but Schopenhauer's interpretation actually makes its way into um, uh, early 20th century neo-Vedantic interpretation of the own tradition because it is laden with political agenda of proving the worth of Indian thought in the face of uh, national consciousness against the British um, feeling of independence and so on. Um, when I started working on this, uh, I, I went through all of these ways of what am I trying to do with, with these different interpretations. In the beginning I thought, oh my god, Schopenhauer is wrong, and this is not at all what the original text meant. And then I sat and thought, who am I after millennia of um, reinterpretations of the text to talk to have any claim on the original meaning? Mm -hmm. Then I thought, um, by extension, who are Indian people to have a claim on originality just because they are in the tradition? Um, and because the text has gone through so many reinterpretations within the tradition, and it's basically an effect of fast-moving globalization that now the text is moving through the hands of so many people who are not in that tradition, but still are interpreters of it, so on and so forth. And going through this process of basically becoming the, the non-judgmental, inhumane heaven and earth in myself because I'm not, <laughs> you know, I, I have to sort of release myself from the claims of benevolence and one-sidedness to any, any interpretation and become, uh, become uh, inhumane, uh, whatever that... Uh. My question is that I, these are, these are waves of almost emotional responses to all these interpretations, right? The political ones, the patriotic ones, the, the commercial ones, the poetic ones, and so on. Um, what, what, how do I see myself? Am I, am I simply a scribe of intellectual history with a sense of humor? Um, Am I allowed to take positions uh, in this process and say, this is going too far, this is close, um, this is a result of X, Y, and Z? Um, where do you see yourself? What is, what is your role as a scholar and intellectual historian? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I, haven't, I haven't quite sorted it out, right, because this I mean, this arose partly from in the, that, the book I, I wrote that I showed the picture of. I gave a coherent reading of the Lao Tzu on this question of, you know, does heaven, the kind of, does, does heaven reward good people and bad people? What's the Lao Tzu's view on that? And, you know, I, I, I gave a coherent reading, but in the end I thought, first of all, like, I recognize that I've made, whatever, 20, 30 interpretive choices, all of which I think are the most likely, but are still only slightly more likely than lots of other opportunities. And I thought the odds of this being right are so slim if you put all of those choices together. And I also thought that, you know, it just doesn't, I don't think it actually fits together, right? Um, but then the question, well, what, what's the goal of interpreting it, right? Then, then that's when it really starts to undermine the whole goal of like, well, I want to give you the real interpretation of it, right? The true interpretation of it. But I still, on a gut level, of course, I'm looking for the true interpretation of these texts, right? And so it's, it's I, I'm still not totally sure that I've sorted it out. I think part of it is, you know, I think anyone who says, like, this is what the text means is either deceiving themselves or deceiving the person they're talking to, right? Like, no one knows for sure. I do think, it, you know, we can say more or less plausible, but we have to be tolerant of multiple interpretations of these texts. So I think that's, you know, one clear output of it. 
And then I think that it's it's worth inquiring, and you've done this with your work on the European side, and, and I did with Leibniz originally, of not just what do these mean, but how are they being interpreted? Like, look more at that side, you know, and what what's going on with those. And I still think, I can't get around wanting to evaluate the accuracy of readings, but I do think that part of what we need to evaluate is other things, right? So, like, what purpose is it being used for? Right, so one thing I think about is, Reading this text should be getting you to think new things. It's very foreign. It's from a very foreign time period. It's a very foreign language. You should be getting new things from reading it. And you can't do that if you just really immediately impose your ideas on it, or just like totally make stuff up. So the thing that maybe annoys me about William Martin's series is that people are getting nothing foreign there. Right? They're entirely getting his views. And that, I feel like, is bad. Not necessarily. I mean, Maybe it's a rationalization for my saying it's inaccurate, right? But I think it's one way to rationalize it is to say it's not the accuracy that's the issue, but the, the, the ability to get to something new and something that's foreign. And then, of course, you know, you can look at Hegel's readings, Schopenhauer, certain I could look at Leibniz, like, you know, these misinterpreters were probably being used to justify colonialism, right? So there's political pressures. We could criticize, you know, the Patriot thing, not because it's inaccurate, but because of the purposes for which it's being used, right? So from a more ethical standpoint than an accuracy standpoint. But that's something that I feel like has not been, at least on the Chinese side, it hasn't been thought through at all, right? Like, well, how would we think about that looking more at those factors rather than accuracy? <coughs> Broadly in hermeneutics, there's been some focus on it, but not as much, I think, as there should be maybe about what that would mean. What's troubling me is, is the question of cultural appropriation. <clears throat> um, when, when people are not invested in the culture they're profiting from, and that, that's, that's a really tricky part of it, right? So we can talk about the elasticity of interpretation, the, the, the acceptable range of interpretation is always inherent in every text, right? Like in philosophy, most of the texts we work with are translated. I mean, nearly all of them, right? When we teach uh, Plato, when we teach uh, Kant, when we teach Nietzsche, we don't use their original texts. So all of them are translated texts. So there is a range of possible meanings. Yet at the same time, there is sort of invest effort in getting it right, right? So when those people are coming to do those kind of egregious acts of cultural appropriation, I think that's outside the line, and we got to keep that. I mean, it's not easy, but I think we need to keep that clear uh, in terms of what those cultural appropriations, uh, the act of cultural appropriation, and those are those are sort of invested in the act of getting things right. We might not always get it all right, but it's not a bridge to the act of cultural appropriation, I think. Yeah. I agree with the feelings about that. So. I mean, essentially anyone, I think, from 250 BC on is appropriating these texts, yeah. right? So the idea that, that anyone, I mean, they're all using it for their own purposes, right? And I think the idea that there's sort of one Chinese culture that somehow yeah. people now would speak for these ancient texts, conceptually, I can't figure out how to justify that. Right? I, 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 I. I don't know, I, I feel uncomfortable kind of blurting the boundary because then people like Webb and Martin would say, oh, well, you guys are just doing exactly the same thing as what I do. And I, I, I don't think what we do is the same as what he is doing in terms of doing this little kind of cultural appropriation. I mean, when I read Khan, I am culture appropriating him because I don't read German, right. right? But there's a consistent effort in getting him right, right? I don't think those people are investing in such a thing and those those people within working within that kind of boundary has kind of self-reflective effort in trying to get it right. I suppose yeah. those kind of people, I think people in the news are talking about this Aloha Poke, the Chicago company that mm -hmm. tried to trademark mm -hmm. the culture that he's not even invested in and yet profit from it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's a very the same kind of thing though. to me. I think it's a very different case from the ancient, from the other than ancient text. But the problem is, I think it is a difference of degrees. Right, and William Martin is a, that's an extreme, right? I presented that. That might be the only one that I presented who has no concern with getting it right, right? There's more or less concerns, but 
anyone who's using it to address contemporary issues. I mean, including Hans Georg Wohler, his sort of non-humanist view, the anti-humanist view, Rogers' readings of it, my readings of it. That's all using it for our own purposes. You know what I mean? And it's not just purely an accurate reading. Anyone who thinks it's purely their most accurate reading, I think, is deceiving themselves, right? Mm -hmm. It's being used for a certain purpose. And I don't want to say that's all illegitimate, right? So it is, there is some question of degrees there. And where's the line where it's, you know, if someone has no interest at all, then, you know, I think that's objectionable for various different reasons. Right. I, I um, think they are they are different in kind. I mean, those are this colonial yeah. literature. There's plenty of made up uh, literature about indigenous cultures, the indigenous novel, which they never visit the place. I mean, those are different in kind to me. That they don't have any investment in the culture they're writing about, and then they profit from it. Yeah. That's just. Yeah. Yeah. So I have Stephen there. Oh. Oh, Stephen. Oh, yeah. Um. This is. A different tack, really. Um, or perhaps it isn't, I'm not quite sure. But you started off, and I'm in much the same position as you are, by the way. I know almost nothing about ancient Chinese texts, but I know quite a lot about um, language and cognition as process. Um, but you started off by saying, well, there's some sort of parallel between this um, dynamical view of language and cognition as something within which we live. and um, what I'm going to talk about. And, and, and clearly there is in some sense. And then we had a very interesting discussion which um, Rosalie introduced the other day, if I got your name right. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, about, about Heidegger, <laughs> Heidegger's view of philosophy as being Greek. And, and basically, I think what Heidegger meant by that was something along the lines that you have to make up your own language to describe the world, as the Greeks have done. And yet what seems to be going on here is, is where the world is sort of making up the language using the same resources over and over again. And I, and I wonder if that isn't another way of thinking about philosophy, a sort of process way of thinking about philosophy, that your own presentation seems to have, have done. And now I'm going to do something really awful. I'm going to say, what do you think philosophy is? But the, just the, 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 you're saying that this, having these certain resources that are taken up in different ways over and over again, that's what you're saying? Is well, I'm it? saying that there's a process of re if you like, and we are part of that process of re and there are various ways of doing it. In the Greek tradition of philosophy, you make up your own image of the world using this language, and then discuss that in terms of truth and beauty and so on, which is what Heidegger was looking to re-establish. If you take that as your benchmark for what philosophy is, I think there's a strong case to be made for saying that philosophy is Greek. But of course, that's just one way of thinking about philosophy. But my sense coming this, I think, naive person is, is that you're looking at philosophy very different interesting kind of way that's perhaps more compatible with our focus on languaging and re and becoming through the languaging that you do and learning as you go and, and not assuming that there is that there are fixed categories within which the text must be interpreted although well, there may, may be virtuous or wrong categories in our time and place right so I, I think I'm not I'm not quite following here the contrast that you're making up to the Greek. I mean, it seems like in both cases, there's this constant redetermining of the language that was used, right, in the Chinese side and on the Greek side. But you're saying the Greek idea was that they invented it out Absolutely. of Absolutely. It's not a question about languages. It's a question about what philosophy becomes. Right. So I think, I mean, the, the I would hold you that I think is, is similar to Heidegger's view, right? But that's... You know, there's no, we're never purely philosophizing, right? Because we're always already within a language that has a history. And so we're always reinterpreting that context that we have. So there would be no sort of Descartes' idea that we would just forget everything and then get the truth. Uh, which, you know, could be kind of Plato's idea, maybe, right? I don't think it's Aristotle's idea, but, but you could maybe say it's Plato's idea. Uh, you know, so I, I want to reject that kind of Cartesian view. And I think it's something closer to Heidegger's view. So I, I do think that you know we're always in dialogue with the history of philosophy and always in this process.
process of reinterpreting, you know. And in a way, what I'm directing at more in this paper is the idea that people who just do the history of philosophy aren't doing that reinterpretation. They're just presenting what was the past of this stuff, right? I want to say that no, it's it's always we we'll always have certain contemporary motivations that's always guiding how we read these texts and how we're interpreting the texts. Um, but I would, I don't know, to define philosophy overall, you know, yeah, that's too hard a question. You know. But I do think there, the, a hermeneutic aspect is inescapable, I think, for philosophy, and a historical aspect, I think, is inescapable for it. Shall we pause in a few minutes? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. That was excellent. Um, so, I, I noted a sort of tension here, I think, that I, I want to sort of point out and maybe I'll offer a suggestion because the speaker actually mentioned Kant. I think the Kantian idea came into my mind. So the tension is this. Um, we want to acknowledge this sort of intertextuality and hermeneutical inescapability of these sorts of ideas. Um, but then that quickly leads to a kind of relativism if you're not very careful. It's like, okay, then how do we negotiate the plurality of interpretations? Well, as you rightfully noted, and I agree with your instinct, well, part of me wants to go, no, there's accuracy, there are truth conditions, there are, there are accuracy conditions that can be met or failed to be met by any given act of interpretation. So then how do we, how do we go to that idea, back to that idea to you know, favor some interpretations over others without going, lapsing back into the objective? And so it seems that even within this discussion, there's this move from the, Oh, subjective, purely subjective to objective. How do we kind of hold the middle in a, in a skillful way? And I, my suggestion, and I've been working on this in my own work, and I'm not going to bore you with what that is right now, is just this Kantian idea, this distinction between constitutive ideals and regulative ideals that he uses at the end of the Critique of Pure Reason and also in his ethical writings. And the idea here is that the truth, the objective truth of the text, the, the idea that we are answerable to something outside of our own thinking, is not something constitutive. It's not something that you can arrive at, but it's something regulative that you have to keep in the back as a, as a normative ideal that's asymptotic. And, and that, that means that you can use that ideal as a mechanism to criticize, but if you ever lapse into the view that you've actually got it, you've failed in some way. You've, you've let go of the actual, uh, what Husserl called the infinite task. Um, so I'm wondering if that, you know, we, I know the thing with this conference has been a kind of 4E cognition thing, but I've, I've always been in the 4E cognition is deeply indebted to Kant. So I, I don't know if that helps, but I think it's important because even in your discussion I saw this, it's like the, you, the objectivist intuitions never go away. So we have to find a way of, of being true to them, even as we, you know, go into this more hermeneutical interpretive uh, frame for thinking about the meaning of text. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. And that's in practice, like how I approach it, right, and how I teach, right. So I would tell students, uh, yeah, you're not actually going to get the, the truth of these texts, but you should act like that's what you're trying to get, right, because that's the most useful way to read them is to strive to get that true meaning, right. So I, I agree with that, and I think that continuity of it as a regular ideal is, is good, right, and, and I think that's right. I think I do want to raise a question that, you know, is that the only regulative ideal? And I do think in Chinese, there are cases in Chinese philosophy where I think, like, okay, yeah, that's a plausible reading, and this is a plausible reading, and that one's boring, and this one is fruitful, <laughs> and that's a reason to go with this one. Yeah. But not to say you can't use that one, right? But still, that, that you know, what's going to be more fruitful, I certainly think is a valid part of the criteria in interpreting these texts. Once you get to say, like, okay, but that's plausible, and that's not. And I'd say there, there's some, and I've been looking to find resources on it, very, not very actively looking, looking. Um, so think about like the question is what if you have two interpretations and one you think like this is the more probable interpretation but this one is possible. Mm. What do you do in that? Do you pretend like the probable one is the true one? I think that's the intuition is to do that, but that doesn't actually seem to follow. I think, right? It, it'd be more, you know, what if the, the less probable one is actually a much more interesting one? You know, then if, can you do that? You know, I don't know how to think through those kinds of questions. So if we're all agree with you, I just want to say I think there's other factors to consider. In the picture. Yeah, so we have people back there, Paul, and, uh, and then Professor John, so that we have to take our answers short. But I, I do like to hear the scholars from time to year, so how we move through this kind of culture now, data that is not really the text, but the really events as well. So Paul and Paul. Yeah. Uh, this is just a quick, I, I'm still operating on 
Say like okay, you guys translate this. Right? And that gives some sense of the plurality of it and the, the foreignness of it when you see how each character has such a wide range of meanings. Right? So it's difficult to find a way to convey that, but I do think that's a good point. Thank you. I'm um, I'm Sarah. I'm from
I already totally agree about your opinion about you can get new ideas from the reading. So this is very important because uh, most of the text you know in Chinese come from the experience or the background story. I think it's um, most important if you are uh, if you are uh, uh, present the story you know the behind of the text. So it's, it's, it's very easy to, um, uh, useful for the people to, to uh, get the main idea of the uh, text. So, so maybe uh, if, you, you, if you say about the meaning, maybe just yours, it's not everybody. Because everybody is uh, the different, they get the different meanings of the text. And in China, it's, uh, say, it's, it's, uh, if you, Get some meanings is for you is enough. It's not totally that the, the, the accurate meanings is not always not accurate meanings in, 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 in most of the text. So I think it's um, in some of the books in China, they always give the story. You means just uh, you, you give some of the uh, how to teach how to teach it. And uh, not to give the fish. This is just come from the story, a true story. It's something like a history. It's a, it's a history of experience from the people. Because the text is not only just thinking about this come from the experience. So you can give some idea of the story and background. Maybe it's just maybe very bad for understanding for the people. The people can be just to get the useful meanings. It's okay, it's enough. And, and the meanings is, I think, is the. The different from the generations, maybe it's more than because it's uh, 1,000 years ago. This is different meanings, but it's not important. <coughs> so nowadays, we get the more useful, available meanings. So thank you. It's yeah. not a bad question, but it's uh, yeah, yeah my so, Thank you. And uh, thank that's you. one way in which there, 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 there are some. I, I'm trying to blur the line between sort of Chinese readings of it and Western yeah. readings of it, and I want to stick with that. But there are also clearly distinctions, right? And one is that I came at these texts with no background knowledge. I don't know any of the stories. I don't know, you know, people. You grew up probably hearing certain yeah. sayings that come back to Lao Tzu. I have none of that in the background, right? And that you could say makes my reading less accurate, maybe, right? But then those sayings themselves often came. Right, and that kind of thing. But it certainly creates a split in how we encounter the text and how we read the text. Um, and I often think about this compared to Christianity, too. You know, when I talk to Chinese Christians, <laughs> a lot of my negative views of Christianity, of course, are not from like reading the Bible, right? They're from like the political uses of Christianity yeah, that I know of in America, and they don't have that background. So you know? it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's different. It's quite different. It's yeah. Chinese, Chinese philosophy to come from the years, from the story, two story. It's also there's another philosopher called Nenyu. Nenyu is uh, just um, the teacher's word say to the <coughs> student. It does uh, the, the, the normal life. They say it was and uh, it's a uh, very totally philosophy, the top level in China. Mm -hmm. So this is why we can find some of the background, maybe it's a much better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, with that, uh, bring us to really the theme of our conference. Is one of the key is the events, how, how experience things is so important for us to make meaning. So in addition to interpreting the text, I thought. So that was a, was a good combination of both readings and experience. I think I'll just read a view and uh, if you have your view, the common core is to experience first. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. Okay.